Hello and welcome. I'm Govind Raj Raj. India has about 7.3 million cases of COVID-19 right now. More than six and a half or close to six and a half million people have recovered and there have been about 111,000 deaths so far. Now, India is just behind the United States in terms of uh, overall numbers uh, at A, which is at 8 million. But uh, the United States is much higher in terms of number of deaths recorded, which is about 217,000. This is just to give you a sense. Now, the state of Maharashtra within India leads in both the number of cases and uh, deaths. So roughly, if we were to look at the numbers, India has uh, maybe about 20 percent or close to 20, 16 to 20 percent of the total number of cases globally, but, uh, but only 10 percent of the deaths. So uh, the mortality uh, rates seem to be uh, favorable at this point. Now, more importantly, and to the present, uh, India had hit a peak of about 96,000 cases a day, roughly, in sept on September 11th. And uh, another uh, similar peak was uh, witnessed on the 17th of September at about 97,000 cases uh, a day. Since then, the graph uh, seems to have declined. Now, we are in the middle of October, and there seems to be a steady but, uh, but uh, general, uh, but uh, definitive uh, decline, and we are at about 55 to 60,000 cases a day. A long way to go in terms of uh, any firm conclusions, but perhaps this is a uh, number to be noted and to understand what uh, this means and where we should be going. And of course, to get a, uh, a check on, a uh, status check on where we are in the overall fight against this uh, dreaded disease. To do this, uh, I have no better than the uh, right person, uh, Professor Dr. Srinath Reddy of the Public Health Foundation of India, joining me. Dr. Reddy, thank you very much. Welcome. Right. So, uh, uh, Dr. Reddy, how are you seeing this uh, uh, current trajectory uh, of cases and uh, w what are the conclusions, if any, that you're drawing at this point? Firstly, when we look at the cases, we must, of course, be quite happy that despite the increase in testing numbers, uh, the case counts are coming down fairly steadily now. Uh, part of this problem could be also due to the kind of tests that we are employing, the rapid antigen tests, which actually have a lower sensitivity. Uh, and therefore, they may be having more false negatives. Despite that, the trend of falling case numbers is certainly encouraging. But because of the problem that we have with the kind of tests being employed, the number of tests being performed, and the criteria for testing, particularly now that on-demand testing is permitted to the private labs. There can be a fair amount of confusion about whether the actual case numbers really reflect the day-to-day -day trends accurately. Overall, it appears to be encouraging, no doubt about it. But, right, as but if you're saying repeatedly, yeah, I believe it is the number of deaths that matter quite a lot. Right. And if you look Absolutely. at the and deaths, I'm, I'm going to. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, and I'm going to come to that uh, in a, right. I'm going to come to that in a moment. But uh, uh, tell us a little more about the tests. I mean, if you're saying that uh, the test numbers are confusing, is that I mean, is that something that can throw the number that we are seeing completely off? So, for instance, if you're saying 55 to 60,000 cases a day today versus, let's say, the September peak of 96,000, could it be that these numbers are uh, completely off, partly off? I'm, I'm not saying that the numbers are off. We are going in the right direction, but with a foggy light. The light is not absolutely crystal clear to tell us this is exactly how the road conditions are. What I'm saying is that the decline in the case count is very encouraging, but to actually keep the track of the daily cases when the kind of tests that are being employed, the number of tests being, uh, being done, as well as the criteria for testing are varying, this is not the most precise way of tracking an epidemic. But even despite those limitations, this is definitely an encouraging trend. Are you able to triangulate from elsewhere, uh, Dr. Reddy, looking at any other uh, data in terms of uh, maybe hospital admissions, uh, other kind, uh, any other indicators that are telling you where we are, whichever way? OK. The, Triangulation with hospital admissions is certainly helpful. Again, there the indications are very. Previously, we used to admit everybody who has test positive. Now, in several cases, we are advising home care for mild cases. 
So therefore, again, that's not necessarily a very reliable indicator. However, deaths are the best indicator because other ones are having this kind of a variable noise to signal ratio. Even if the deaths are undercounted, the noise to signal ratio is relatively more constant in the case of deaths. And therefore, looking at the trend in deaths, it's uh, very encouraging to find that at least for the last 10 days, the deaths have been coming down and now we have actually hit 638 deaths yesterday. So, which is quite a remarkable decrease. And also we must recognize that deaths actually follow cases by about almost 10 to 15 days. So the fact that the deaths have been steadily decreasing for about last 10 days means the cases also must have been decreasing at least about 20 days or 24 days earlier. So which means that over a period of nearly a month, we have been seeing substantial improvement. So taking both right. the cases into account and the deaths into account, I definitely see an improvement. Right. So, and, and you're saying that uh, deaths is a far more linear way of uh, trying to understand where we are rather than maybe looking at tests and uh, uh, positive tests. Well, the cases are an important element, but when you actually do not have the same types of tests being performed on a regular basis and the same number of tests being performed, uh, and the criteria for testing varying, there is a certain degree of fuzziness that is introduced. Whereas in deaths, we are dealing with much greater level of certainty of the signal. Right. So uh, let's let, 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 we'll come back to deaths in a moment. So let's talk about why this is happening and what's changing. So uh, what are your key, let's say, uh, uh, points of understanding or your conclusions at this point? So why are number one deaths coming down? Uh, and why is it that the number of cases are also coming down, particularly when contrasted with uh, maybe other parts of the world like the United Kingdom, uh, Europe broadly, maybe even the United States where cases are still rising and sometimes at uh, fairly high proportionate levels? Well, all through, our deaths have been much lower than in Europe and the United States. In our case, if you actually look at where the epidemic started, and progressed substantially, it was in the big cities. And our rural population is fairly high, where the spread of the virus has been later and probably slower. So let's just compare cities with cities in the West and in India. Then if we do that, we find that Delhi is about three times less in terms of deaths per million than Washington, D.C. And Mumbai, which has the highest number of deaths here, is again about three times less in terms of deaths per million than Madrid. And so also Chennai and, 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 and Dr. Reddy, this is at this point or this? are you comparing this with the peak? I'm, I'm talking about the total deaths so far. So far, okay. The total deaths so far. So in a sense, if you compare the like with like, which are big cities and big cities, India has done much better than Europe and the United States. And now in Europe, you are seeing the second wave starting. And we do not know what the numbers are going to be there. We too will have to brace ourselves for a possible second wave. And also our first wave, I don't think is complete because now we are seeing the virus moving into smaller towns and into the villages. And we'll have to try and control the transmission as well as ensure that the death rates keep going down. So we still have challenges, but nevertheless, comparing it like with like, the big cities with the big cities, we have done much better than the West. Okay, and I'm going to come to the transmission part in a moment. So, uh, so why is this happening, Dr. Reddy? So is it because uh, our uh, treatments are working better? Uh, we, as a, we as a population or a race, are more receptive to these treatments or something else? No, I think there are multiple factors. Firstly, we are much younger than the West. And therefore, the level of comorbidities also is much lower under the age of 60 than above the age of 60. And if you have many more people in the age group above 60, like in the West, therefore, the likelihood of having more severe disease is definitely there. 
And you know, even something like overweight and obesity is much more in the West. Though we do have a problem of diabetes and hypertension, even in our middle-aged population. But definitely, age is a protective factor for us. Then it is also possible that we experience the wave of ascent uh, much later than in Europe, which really started getting into serious trouble in February and March, whereas our problem started much more in May after the lockdown ease. And by that time, we had a lot more knowledge of what to do, uh, with not only in terms of prevention, but in terms of treatments, management. We knew uh, that oxygen was helpful. Ventilators were not really necessary in very many people. Uh, we also knew about some other methods like proning, making people lie on flat on their belly, improves oxygenation. There were so many other things that were happening at that time. We gained also from our own expertise, but also from global knowledge. So I think particularly age and also the fact that we happen to benefit from the experience elsewhere in the world because of a slightly later onset of the epidemic wave, that helped us. Right, but are, are you getting a sense in any way that uh, we are responding differently to treatment or, or better to treatment? I mean, the same medicines, I guess, are being used everywhere. I, I think basically our own uh, treatments have been very effective in the way people have managed it in the big cities, in the hospitals, and our uh, fatality rates have been lower. I think partly because, as I said, the global knowledge has been accumulating but also a very energetic response in terms of treatment modalities. So we'll have to give credit to both. Firstly, the lower risk itself of our population because of the age, and also earlier and more prompt treatment. We are still losing cases because we are not detecting cases as early as we should. But nevertheless, despite that limitation, energetic treatment is started when people do get to the hospital, and that is where lives are being saved. And uh, is, there a, uh, is it possible to put a number on that, Dr. Reddy? Suppose you said that, okay, uh, uh, today uh, hun of 100 patients, maybe X number are turning up late, but if those X turned up earlier, then so many could be saved. Well, our case fatality rate itself shows over the period of last few months uh, that we have actually had about uh, initially anywhere between 3 to 5% of case fatality rate and now it is about 1.5%. Now the uh, situation has also changed with the milder cases being asked to take treatment at home, but the severe cases being rushed to hospitals and being taken care of much earlier rather than having to move around and searching for a hospital and being rejected at some and finally getting admitted after much delay. So I think our systems are much better prepared. I can't put a fraction on that Obviously, there is a much better system operating now in terms of earlier detection and earlier admissions. Right. Okay. So, you uh, you mentioned transmission, uh, Dr. Reddy. So, now, uh, you know, we are continuing to unlock. Uh, we are looking at opening up movie halls. Schools have still not been opened, but are likely to be. There's a lot of pressure. There's pressure, for instance, uh, in the state of Maharashtra, where I am, to open up temples. Uh, and there might be similar pressures elsewhere. So how do things look going forward? Well, I don't think we can take anything for granted. We are fortunate that we have actually managed to gain some level of control right now. And I hope that will continue despite the fact that the virus is now entering new territories. It's entering smaller towns and entering villages. So we can't say that the battle has been won, far from it. But we have to also make sure that in these cities and districts where the numbers have started going down, we do not have a second wave because of our carelessness. This we have seen in Europe, in UK, in the United States, even in Spain, France, where after very rigorous control and considerable amount of success, suddenly there was an air of relaxation and that we must celebrate the summer and before we enter into the winter. And we have seen how the virus has now spread rapidly. They're going into second lockdowns. We have to make sure that we continue our vigilance at least till next April or May 
till we understand this epidemic trends in our population much better. And for that, we do not know. Large parts of India may be not having such a severe winter as Europe, but some parts of India will have a severe winter. And we do not know how the virus will behave when the weather turns cold and whether there's going to be a resurgence. And with the festive season coming up, there is always the danger of super spreader events. And we know whether it is in Europe or elsewhere, and in India too, we have evidence now that it is the super spreader events that are the most dangerous. And the moment we have large crowds going in, whether for religious reasons or social reasons or uh, other political rallies, then we are going to have this problem anyway. So I think the vigilance has to be particularly maintained during the festive season. And we have to exhibit a great deal of restraint. Uh, we can celebrate joyfully at home, but not necessarily crowd in public places. And uh, are you getting a sense uh, at this point whether we are able to manage uh, numbers uh, or the kind of treatment in smaller towns and villages? I, I, know, I do that's know that from my conversations with doctors, a lot of people uh, are coming to cities. But that's always the case. I mean, that's, that's not a new uh, uh, trend in itself. That is a challenge. But one of the things that actually distinguishes it from other emergencies for which people come to cities is that in most cases do not require very sophisticated management. Mild cases can actually be managed at home. And as long as their oxygen is monitored with a pulse oximeter, temperature is monitored with a thermometer, and a sense of breathlessness, if it is there, will be an indication for uh, admission to the hospital. And even in the hospital, we know that majority of the patients will improve on oxygen alone if they need it, if they're very sick. Uh, firstly, as I said, proning, lying on the belly, improves oxygenation. Then oxygen itself, if it is a high flow oxygen, continuously administered, that helps. Therefore, you do not require uh, the kind of intensive care units uh, for most patients uh, that, that have been used in the larger city hospitals. So if we can actually manage these facilities well, I know we are having challenges with oxygen supply. That is something that must be overcome. If we can equip our district hospitals and even our smaller hospitals well, and use our primary healthcare teams much better, you do not necessarily have to rush everybody to a big city hospital. Right, and uh, uh, two uh, questions uh, are partly related, I guess. So first is treatment protocols. Uh, how are you seeing uh, the way we are applying the treatment protocols that we are applying? And do you see any further innovation, uh, for lack of any other word in that, which could obviously help alleviate the problem? And secondly, vaccines. Uh, what's your current understanding of uh, its introduction into India? Uh, what is the time frame and how do you see it rolling out? Firstly, being a new virus and demanding trials to be completed to generate the evidence for treatment, we are still searching for the answers, though we do have one clear-cut trial evidence that in very sick patients who require intensive care, steroids are very helpful. Not to be given in mild cases, but moderate and severe cases, particularly those who are on oxygen and who are on ventilators, it's very helpful. Uh, but beyond that, we do not have a clear-cut evidence of a life-saving drug. We are looking at various drugs, some of which may have cut short the treatment period, but have, did not have an effect on the actual saving lives. And other trial results are expected soon on some of those drugs too. But we also are now looking at new, not only new drugs, but monoclonal antibodies, which are likely to at least help boost whatever immunity our body is producing. They will actually act as a supplement to that to quickly overcome the virus. Now, these monoclonal antibodies can be used either as part of treatment or as part of prevention immediately after exposure, before the actual infection really flares up. But again, these require trial evidence. Trials have started, but on compassionate ground, people are being given every, in different places, including India. And, you know, President Trump has received it. But actual trial evidence is not available. So right. I would say that we do have some drugs 
which have some evidence behind them, some ev drugs which have some rationale behind them, but evidence still awaited. Uh, but it's likely that in the next few months we'll get much greater clarity. But as far as vaccines are concerned, I think we have several candidate vaccines which are developing, most of which are systemically uh, uh, administered and will reduce the risk of severe infection, even though they may not be able to prevent the infection entering the body. Uh, for that, you require a different kind of vaccine called sterilizing vaccine, which is a mucosal vaccine, which doesn't allow the virus even to settle in the nose. And those are under development and those still have to enter clinical trials. Those which are in, under clinical trials, which are likely to protect against the virus after the infection from developing into a severe illness, those are now reaching the stage of phase three trials being completed by the end of the year, at least in a few of the vaccines, which are fairly advanced in trials. Others are still in phase one and phase two. Okay. So we are likely to see some clear cut results in some of the vaccines by the end of the year. But by the time the regulatory scrutiny and approvals are completed, it will probably be the first quarter of the year that we may have a vaccine. But with the caveat that we still have to absolutely have the proof that this is safe, this is efficacious, and has reasonable immunological evidence of duration of protection, at least for a few months. It cannot be an evanescent protection because then it will be of no use. All of these need to be rigorously studied in terms of the evidence that the trials produce. We have considerable amount of hope, but nothing should be taken for granted. And right. therefore, right. We, we have to keep up our mask, physical distancing, avoiding crowding. Right. And yeah, I mean, that was in a way my last question to you, uh, Dr. Reddy. So you said that, you know, we have to be vigilant and alert till March, April next year. So is that where you're seeing the whole uh, curve, let's say, either plateau out completely or die down? Or is it just that from where we are today, that appears like the, maybe the earliest date when things could settle down? Well, whether it is a vaccine coming in or whether it's the virus itself changing its virulence and becoming far less virulent because of evolutionary biology, it is probably going to take up to that time. But the reason I said March, April is that is where when winter will end in most of India. And we are not sure what winter is going to bring to us. So till that winter ends, till the spring of hope comes in, uh, we will not be able to say for certain that we have really conquered the virus. But conquering the virus doesn't necessarily mean that we have completely eliminated the virus from us. That threat will continue to be there with us. So we have to maintain a fair amount of uh, protective measures even after that. But by March, April, we'll be much clearer as to what are the instruments we have at hand uh, to beat it back. Right, uh, Dr. Reddy. So we've uh, uh, so held on for seven, eight months. I'm sure we can do for uh, three or four or four or five months more. On that note, thank you so much for joining me and uh, sharing your insights and thoughts and a pleasure to speak to you as always. Thank you.